All right, let's go ahead and get started. So, if I can guide your attention, please. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me? Thank you. All right, so, today we're going to be starting to talk about uh, advanced image capture. We're going to be talking about some uh, storing settings and files and such on the phone. And we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about how to do actual image processing on the video streams that we're recording. We're also going to be doing some Bluetooth communication, and we're going to actually start working with the control part of the course, which involves these little Arduino boards. So these little guys have a uh, Bluetooth module that can communicate with our phone, and so we will be able to do things like send commands the Bluetooth, over Bluetooth to the Arduino, uh, get responses back over Bluetooth, etc. Um, we're also going to pick up a few miscellaneous computer science goodies along the way, such as how to actually properly uh, set up and clean up our applications as we enter into them and exit out of them. So we'll talk a little bit about what's called the Windows Phone application life cycle. And we're also going to talk about how to avoid thread contention, which is something that a lot of you have faced with this last homework and now hopefully have a healthy respect for so we understand the kind of problems that can come up when we have multiple threads and why it causes like uh, uh, application crashes and things like that. So, first to talk about application lifecycle, the first thing we do is we look at the MSDN docs. There's actually a pretty nice uh, web page right here that has a graphic which is pretty helpful in understanding what on earth uh, the application lifecycle means. So they have this interesting little diagram that shows the different events that get launched on an application uh, basis, things that get launched on a page basis, and what it means for your program. So first off, the difference between the application and page is in Visual Studio, uh, let's go ahead and open up a new project, you may have noticed that there is a, um, we'll just create a new one called Phone App one and we'll just throw it onto our desktop. You may have noticed that there are two XAML files and two XAML.cs files, and we do all of our work inside one, this main page.xaml guy. But there is actually also an app.xaml. Occasionally, you may find yourself uh, looking at code in here if, say, your application crashes, and you're looking at the default uh, unhandled exception thing right here. You may find yourself looking at this part of the application quite often. Now what this app.xaml.cs file is, is the c -sharp file that defines behavior for your application on an application scale. So what that means is we're looking at uh, behavior that is not linked to any particular uh, user interface element it's linked to your overall application. So this is things like behavior that you want to happen when someone starts up your application, no matter which UI element they're looking at. If your application has, say, multiple pages. You may have noticed that a lot of Windows Phone 8 applications have these things called live tiles, where you can put these tiles on your home screen, and they can show different pieces of information about your, um, about your application. If you put this kind of functionality into your application, you can actually have a user enter your application at different, at different points. For instance, the One Bus Away app, you can put a, um, a live tile on your home screen where you click it and it takes you directly to the particular stop that you've bookmarked in your favorites list or something like that. And that kind of a behavior allows, you to en allows a user to enter the application at a point that isn't like their main page. It's some other page that's already pre-populated with data. This logic is completely divorced of that. This logic happens for your entire application, no matter how the user is entering the application. So this is where you have things like, if there is an unhandled exception, call this function. So no matter where you are in the application, if an unhandled exception gets thrown, we're going to call this application unhandled exception function. Um, it does some special stuff if a debugger is attached. It has these events called application launching, application activated, application deactivated. These are the kinds of things that show up in that graphic that we were looking at in the MSDN docs earlier, also application closing. There's some error handling right here, 
And then there's other stuff that honestly we don't really care about because it's putting things into alternate languages and that's just too fancy for us. So here we can see that when the user starts to use our program, it's first going to call application launching event. Then for a page, it's going to call this onNavigated2 method. So those of you who have been looking at the homework solutions may have seen me use this onNavigated2 method a few times, as well as things such as the onNavigated from method. Yes? They're completely independent. So you can use whichever one you want. There are default behaviors for all of these uh, events. And when we use them, we'll override whichever ones we want. So when a user is using your, uh, is using your application, first these two events get called, and we get into the running state. Then if they were to, say, hit the back button, it will say on navigated from, application closing, and your uh, your application is terminated, and there's nothing. There's no traces of it left in the operating system's memory. However, if you were to say uh, get a call in the middle of your application, or if you were to say press the search button, uh, these kinds of things open up kind of a new application on top of yours, and your application is sent into what's called a dormant state, which is where it's still in memory, but it's uh, it's kind of halfway between uh, dead and alive. There's an even closer to dead version of that called tombstoned, um, but the, the takeaway from this is that there are ways for your application to kind of, it's not actually running, but its contents are still in memory. And the reason they do this is because if someone hits the search button, wants to look something up and then returns to your app, they can then hit the back button again. So that would look something like this. If we have a application open, say, the camera. So the camera comes up, and it's like this. And if I press the search button, it opens up this little search thing. I agree to their license terms, and I have the search option. When I hit back, it just immediately pops me back into the camera app. And the camera app is set up in such a way that that just works. And the initialization of this camera window is happening once throughout that entire demonstration. When we hit the back button, we actually come back into the app, and most things will kind of quote unquote just work, where XAML elements, all that kind of stuff is still uh, alive in the program. All that happens is when we go here, the code stops running, but all that, all the uh, data and XAML elements and all that stuff is still sitting around in memory right now. Now, if I were to hit the start button, and I don't know if you guys know this, but if you hold down the back button, it brings up this kind of multitasker. We can see that the camera app is still running, but uh, I believe there's a way to dismiss it. Either you swipe up or swipe down or something to, in order to close it. But as long as it's sitting in there, it's still running in the background. If I hit the Windows key, well, hmm. Usually it quits, but there are ways to ask your application to not quit uh, when you hit the, the Windows key or the back key. The takeaway from this, however, is that your application doesn't necessarily die when you press the, uh, when you, you know, navigate away from it. And there are a few cases where that can screw things up a little bit inside your program if you're not taking advantage of the onNavigated2 and onNavigated from events properly. The case study that we're going to take a look at is the line graph element. So let's take a look at that. Um, yeah, I should say that on navigated to, on navigated to, on navigated from, and on navigating from uh, are the three that we're going to be most interested in. The difference between on navigated from and on navigating from is a little subtle, but if you're really interested, you can take a look at the uh, MSDN article. Uh, so there's a simple application that is part of the sample code for today's lecture that will demonstrate how to actually use these kinds of events. It's called App Lifecycle, and it's a really simple C-sharp application that will show us 
uh, kind of all the different events that we're interested in and when they get fired and such. So the um, the main UI layout is just a simple text box that has um, that has text that gets appended to it as the application runs. So the first thing it does is when we call the main page constructor, it uh, writes a string out here that says main page and gives us the time at which it was called. We also say protected override void on navigated to navigation event args blah 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 blah. And no, you don't have to memorize all this, of course, because Visual Studio will offer it up for tab completion, and I'll show that in a minute. We then look at this E um, argument, which comes with the onNavigated to function. This E argument has a uh, property called navigation mode. The reason we're interested in navigation mode is because this function gets called whether we're creating the page for the very first time or whether we're resuming it from, uh, from a, being in a dormant state. So what I mean by that is here it says onNavigated to new. If I were to press the search button and then click the back button, it will say it will say that we called on navigating from, we called on navigated from, and then we called on navigated to, and this time it says back. And the reason it says new up here and then back down here is because this e.navigation mode thing at one point was equal to navigation mode.new and now is equal to navigation mode.back. So this argument that it passes into onNavigated2 is the means by which the operating system tells you, hey, we're navigating to this page, but everything's already in memory. Now, you'll notice that this XAML like text entry thing survived between, this, this text block survived between us hitting the search button, where we may think, okay, now it's been destroyed, and then we come back, and realize, oh no, it hasn't been destroyed because all the text that was in there previously is still there, and all we've done is append a little bit more text onto it. This is one of the nice things about XAML elements. They uh, will automatically just stick around. They may get destroyed and reinitialized with their same data, but they, they will do that automatically. This does not hold true for objects that we write, however. So things like sound I.O., do not behave very gracefully in this situation. When we click the search button, the sound I.O., unless we explicitly tell it to stop, will continue trying to read in from the microphone and, and spit out to the speaker. That, that won't necessarily work properly because our application is now in the background and it's not expecting our application to be doing any further processing. So the proper way to deal with this kind of a situation is when we receive an on navigating or on navigated from event, we stop recording. Then when we receive an on navigated to event, we continue recording. In that way, you won't run into problems like you accidentally press the search button, your application gets uh, backgrounded, then when you come back, it just crashes. That's what will happen if we naively try to continue performing operations that we're not supposed to while we've been backgrounded. Any questions about this kind of thing? All right, let's look at a slightly uh, more interesting example. What's the difference between navigating and navigated from? Navigating happens before anything's been destroyed. Navigated happens after some things have been destroyed. There are certain situations where you need one or the other. In general, I use navigating so that I can destroy things as soon as possible. I wonder if it's already in here. It is. So, uh, this is also a good chance for me to show off a feature of Visual Studio that we haven't used so far. A solution is a collection of projects, and there's nothing that stops you from having multiple projects that each create their own app. So here I have this app called App Lifecycle, which we were just looking at. There's also this Line Graph Lifecycle, which is a completely separate application that happens to use the line graph project. In this case, the application lifecycle project does not use the line graph project at all. In order to look at this guy, I can open up C Sharp files and look at them and such, but in order to run it on the emulator, 
you'll notice that this one is bolded, whereas this one's not. That's because this one is set as what's called the startup project. You can right-click on this guy and say, set as startup project, and that will allow you to run this application as the kind of default one for this solution. That's not strictly necessary because you can always right click on this guy and say, okay, I want to build this guy, okay, I want to deploy this guy, but that gets really tiresome because the keyboard sh shortcuts are gonna build and deploy the wrong project and such. So I just switch back and forth between whichever startup project I want because usually I'm only working on one at once. So in line graph lifecycle, what we have is something that doesn't work. Really? Let's try building it again. Oh, it's throwing a hissy fit. All right. I have yet to figure out what operation I'm doing that's screwing up the architecture that's chosen up here, but uh, for some reason there are certain there are times when I want it to say mixed platforms or any CPU, which I'm not entirely sure what the difference between those two are because I feel like those should be the same uh, for this particular application, but I guess it's because of Silverlight's ability to target many, many different platforms. But in any case, the emulator is Win32 architecture and the phone is uh, ARM architecture. So now if we run this guy, what we have is we have two line graphs. One that's red and one that's blue. And again, I have a little log down here that is telling us when functions are getting called. Now, some of you may have noticed in the previous homeworks that if you were to do something that would navigate away from your application and then navigate back, it's possible for your line graph to lose its coloring, the Y limits that were set upon it, that kind of thing. That's because the line graph is written somewhat naively and does not store its, app, its application state properly when it gets destroyed and comes back. Um, you'll notice that the bottom one lost all its styling, but the top one didn't. And that's because the top one is re-implementing the styling when it needs to, uh, when the page is getting resumed. So this uh, sample code gives, shows us how to kind of do that, to uh, tell the y limits to be between negative 1.5 and 1.5 instead of negative 1 to 1 and also to set the color to be red. So this is an example of something where we have an element that breaks when we uh, don't pay attention to the application life cycle and this is one way to fix it. The other way to fix it would be to have it actually serialize itself properly so that it can be stored in between uh, calls. But That's an awful lot more complex than just uh, giving it back the uh, parameters that we gave it when it was first set up. So that's the way that it's been done in this example. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, feel free to look at this code if you want to use a line graph and you don't want to have your lines turn white and uh, have the wrong Y limits. And that's what I'll we'll talk about application lifecycle today. Um, the only other thing that I might talk about is if we were to go into the C-sharp code of an, of an entirely new application, I did mention briefly that Visual Studio will kind of uh, prompt us on how to write a onNavigated2 method and such. And the way it does that is if I type the word override, override means that I am going to write a method Excuse me. I'm going to write a method that is an override of a method that's implemented in an object that's higher up in the higher in the uh, class hierarchy. So that's a lot of object-oriented programming mumbo jumbo. What it means is this main page class conforms to the phone application page type. That's a class type, and we're saying main page is what's called a derivative or a child of phone application page. And phone application page says there are a whole bunch of methods that you can call that I, that I implement. One of them is called onNavigated2. And so when we inherit from phone application page, that's what this means when we're a child of it, 
that means that we automatically get all the functionality that's stored inside a phone application page. And so, if you want to change some of that functionality, we can write, say, public void on navigated to, and we can make a uh, method and such. The only problem with doing it this way is that if I accidentally misspelled on navigated to, or something like that, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put a zero here instead of an O. I don't know why I would do that, but if I did, I would be creating an entirely new function, and I would not be naming it the exact same name as what was in my parent class. And it needs to be the exact same name because as long as it's the exact same name, then the compiler knows, oh, okay, you're replacing the functionality that would otherwise be default functionality. In this case, I'm creating entirely new functionality, and so when the operating system wants to call the onNavigatedTo function, it will just call the default one because they're not the same name. And so what override does is it knows all of the functions that are already in the parent class and allows me to choose the exact ones so that I'm for certain overriding default behavior. So if you type override first, we can go down to on navigated, where is it? There we go, on navigated to, and we get a function that by default does nothing. All it does is it calls the on navigated to that belongs to our parent class. This base keyword is the same thing as super in uh, Java or I think it's also called super or under underscore scooper in Python, that kind of thing. So any other object-oriented programming language you want, uh, there's an analog. Yes? Sorry? What do you mean by created your own class? Yeah. Yeah, you could do the same thing. Um, it's uh, this is this is just functionality that's based on inheritance. So if you created an inheritance hierarchy in your class, where you have a class and then like child classes and stuff, you could do the exact same thing. Yeah, this isn't anything special to Windows Phone Eight. This is just inheritance. All right, let's move on. Uh, yeah, we just talked about this, that there's a, the line graph lifecycle. <clears throat> so I guess I can show you the difference between the two line graphs and what, um, and what happens between the two. So this code is meant to be pretty simple. It's, everything is something that you've uh, seen before. Essentially, we have two line graphs, one for the top, one for the bottom. And we have a dispatcher timer, so we're going to be calling something repeatedly. Uh, we also have this array of data. In our constructor, we construct our dispatcher timer, and we tell it to run 50 times a second, and it's going to run this function called dt_tick. Inside dt_tick, we calculate a phase offset, we make a sinusoids for the data, and then we set them to top graph and bot graph when they're not null. So all this stuff should be pretty familiar to you guys. We're just graphing sinusoids. The interesting stuff happens inside of this initialized line graph, or not inside this initialized line graph thing. This is a convenience method that has been in the solutions for the last two weeks. And basically it does all that initializing the line graph thing, all that hooking up, that we always do the exact same way at the same time, and it puts it into a single method so that we can call it in our loaded events. So here we have top canvas loaded and bot canvas loaded. Top and bot canvas are Funnily enough, the oopsies, the canvases for these two elements. Inside top canvas loaded, what we do is we call this initialized line graph thing, and then we subscribe to the initialized event with uh, and give it a function called setup top canvas. Whereas in bot canvas, we don't do that. We just do our setup right here in the loaded event. Now what this is trying to drive home is that main page gets, the main page constructor gets called, top canvas loaded gets called, and then bot canvas loaded gets called. But when I hit the search button and come back, those loaded events do not get called again. 
And that's why this bottom one does not have the styling applied to it. So if I keep on hitting this search button and, and going back, hitting the search button and going back, we'll see that this setup top canvas function is getting called again and again. And that's because it's been subscribed to this initialized event. And what it does is it sets the top graph to be red and sets its Y limits. And so the initialized event is here so that when you uh, enter this application again and everything's getting reinitialized from its dormant state rather than from its destroyed state, we get the proper styling. <clears throat> Any questions about this stuff? Yes? So log string is just a little function that I have here. It assigns, it appends to log out dot text, which is this guy down here. And it does this date time now dot two string thing so that we get the time that the event happened before the message. That's all it is. All right, let's talk about thread contention. So I'm sure for a lot of you, threads are starting to get a little annoying right now because we have to worry about do we use the dispatcher to touch the UI elements or do we not? Uh, do I have If I have a sound thread working over here and a uh, graphics thread working over here, how do I communicate data back and forth between each other without accidentally touching something while something else is destroying it, etc.? Um, we are going to study something called the lock statement, which is a C-sharp construct specifically designed to fix this kind of a problem. It allows us to what's called lock a section of code. Those of you who have dealt with this kind of thing before, these are often called critical sections, or this is, what you, this is the kind of problem you solve by using things like mutexes or semaphores. And what it allows us to do is it allows us to kind of give like a, what I call a key to the lock statement and then no one else can enter a section with that same key until the original thread has exited that segment. And so this will allow us to modify data without fear and kind of do our business in a way where we can, uh, with a minimal impact to performance, keep on dealing with uh, these kinds of uh, threading issues without crashing. So let's just go right into a demo so we can see what all this looks like. So again, this is a sample code. It's called locks. And what we're going to have is we're going to have an application that crashes, and then we're going to show how to fix it by using the lock statement. And all we're going to do is we're just going to add the lock statement around two pieces of code, and it will fix it. So let's look at the non-fixed version first. So what we have here is we have a really uh, ugly program that has a text block and a button. And when we call, or when we start the program, it's going to create this thing called a timer. <clears throat> now, I specifically had to not use a dispatcher timer because the dispatcher timer does not create a new thread. It runs things on the dispatcher thread. And that's no good for us because that won't crash. <laughs> so what we do is we create a new timer, which is pretty much exactly the same as the dispatcher timer, except it's running on a separate thread. The reason I'm doing it in this way is because it's a nice way to simulate what we usually deal with with things like the sound I.O. threads or what we'll soon be dealing with with camera threads, that kind of thing. So we create some data and we store it in this floating point array and then we start a timer and we tell it to call thread tick and we tell it do it every one milliseconds. So we're doing this like a thousand times a second. We're calling this thread tick function. Thread tick in turn um, loops through the data array, summing it up into average and then dividing by the length to calculate the average value. And then it uses the dispatcher to assign average out to uh, this average out uh, text block. So when I run this, the data starts out initially zero because that's what the new operator does, is it initializes an, uh, an array to all zeros. Or I should say it allocates memory and then initializes it. And so when it runs it, it will just say the average is zero. 
Now when I click the randomize button, it's going to call this randomize button click function. I'm sorry, let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. The randomize button click function creates a random object. This is just a C-sharp class that allows us to create random numbers. It calculates a random new length for data and allocates a new array. And then it goes from 0 to the new length and assigns it a random number between 0 and 1. All right. So when I click randomize, boom, it now says average 0 0.5. Now, does anyone have any idea why this might crash? What we have here. Unused? Yeah, that's right. The problem is, there's a chance that when I say data equals new float, new length, I'm overriding data, and over here in the thread tick, this is happening on a different thread, so there is a chance that at some point, this guy is going to be, say, inside this loop looking at data, when all of a sudden we pull the rug out from under its feet by replacing it with a new data. Now you may say, all right, the worst that's going to happen is, it's going to be halfway through an array, and then all of a sudden, halfway through the array, the array changes, so then it just continues calculating based on the new array. But that's not actually the worst thing because I was very intentional in creating this random new length. And so what can happen is, it's coming through here in a loop, and it's going to stop at what it thinks is the end of the array. But the length of the array can actually change in the middle of this for loop. And so what we see is if I hammer on this randomize button enough times, eventually we're going to crash. And usually it did it within about five seconds when I was testing it at home. But of course, when I'm running it in front of you guys, it's never crashing. So let's try that again. Well, oh, there we go. Whew, finally. All right, so this just kind of drives home the fact that these kinds of bugs are really nasty because they don't always manifest. But let's take a look at our call stack and see what happened. We are inside of this for loop, just like I thought we might be. We take a look at data.length, and it says uh, a very big number that's like 6 million something. And over here, I've saved the old length just for demonstration's sake. So the old length here says 7 million something. So we can see here that the length did indeed change. Gosh darn it. We can say here, see here that the length did indeed change while we were inside the for loop. Now, I've made the, the order of the length of the buffers pretty large. Like, we're, we're talking about buffers that are like millions of elements long, just because that means that we're going to be inside this loop for a longer amount of time, so we have a higher chance of triggering this bug. But the, the, I mean, the uh, truth of the matter is that when we're doing things like audio processing, these functions are running like 100 times a second and such. So I didn't even click that button 100 times, <clears throat> right? So the, the, the chances of a bug like this happening when you're running in a loop that's running 100 times a second and such is pretty high. So even if you have just an infinitesimal chance of running into a, a problem like this, if you think you have an infinitesimal chance, you'll probably eventually hit it when your applications are running this fast. Now, there was a suggestion that said, okay, why don't we just use old length in this uh, right here, so that when we are, so that when we're look, looping over the, the array, we always have the old, uh, the old array's length. The reason we don't do that is because data itself is actually changing. And so if data itself is actually changing, that means that even if I put the old length here, so I'm always looking at the old, uh, the old object's length, I will then over, overrun the uh, length of data itself. 
So if data.length gets shorter while I'm inside here, then if I keep on comparing to old length, I will read too much memory. I'll keep going for longer than I should. Does that make sense? So, all right. The problem here is that the problem at its heart is that we should not be calculating on data that's changing while we're calculating on it. Because even though data.length is 6 million something, I here is already 7 million something. We're already at uh, past the end of the array because the old array was larger. This data.length thing isn't getting evaluated every time we're in this loop. It takes this value, stores it, and then starts running the loop and doesn't care if data.length itself changes. It will just keep running until it reaches the end of that stored length. It's already got this old length. It's, it's already basically taken a copy of data.length and stored it locally and is running its for loop until it reaches the end. It's not going to keep asking data, how long are you, how long are you, how long are you, every time we run this, this loop iteration. Because that would be really slow. So, let's look at the solution. The solution is, we surround everything that touches data with a lock statement. You say lock, and then you give it a key. In this case, you can use any kind of object you want. We could give it a string, we could say key. And then we surround it in curly braces. And this section of code is now locked. We then come down here and we say, all right, we're touching data down here. We say lock, and we pass the same thing in. And now this section is locked. And what this means is, if one thread enters this locks statement, because this one has the same key, when a different thread tries to enter this guy, it will just sit there and wait until the first thread exits out of this lock statement. Now, if I run this and just hammer on the button repeatedly, sorry. I was wondering if the two string is actually one object. Well, we won't use strings in real life. I'm using strings here because they're nice to look at. But really what we're going to do is we're going to create a single object and pass them as the key instead. Yeah. I, mean, I, I actually kind of wonder what you said, too, because technically string is not the same object. So if you do, if you learn that it will work. You're right. That's actually, that's a good question. Let's find out. I don't know. I actually haven't tried it this way. Uh, it's possible that, it, that instead of doing an object comparison, it does a content comparison, but that would be pretty strange. And it doesn't want to run because of some error that's somewhere. Average is not, oh, right. So this floating point has to be outside of lock because it has its own scope. And so I can't use it afterwards down here if I have it in there. So we have to declare it first. All right, that's fine. So we're inside this for loop, and I don't really want to have my breakpoint there. I'll put my breakpoint here. And so if we look at threads, where's my other thread? Oh, I don't want to have a breakpoint here. I want to have a breakpoint in here because this is where the button gets hit. All right. So what I'm going to do is this code is getting called like a thousand times a second, right? So anytime I drop a breakpoint, we're immediately going to hit that breakpoint because it's getting called many, many times a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it run. I'm going to have a breakpoint in the randomized button click. So when I click the randomized button, we stop here. And now we're in this lock statement. And so now the question is, is this thread thing still running? If it's still running, then that means that my lock statements aren't working and I can't use strings like I thought I could. But let's find out if it's still running. We open up the threads window, and we take a look at where these worker threads are. It's not really going to give us much, because it's probably somewhere in, uh, in horrible assembly land. 
So we'll just drop another breakpoint over here, and we'll continue on the main thread and see what happens. Putting a breakpoint here so that we know if we get, make it from here all the way to here without running this thread again. And we do. That's not the most convincing argument of all time. So let's put a thread.sleep in here and sleep for like a thousand milliseconds. So this should, over the course of running from here to here, this thread should run a thousand times. And so if it's not running, then that means that the lock statement is working and it's stopping the other guy from running. So it's running, we hit the randomize button, we plop a breakpoint here, and if we hit the top breakpoint first, then that means the block isn't working properly, so we run, we wait for a second, and we pop down there. So to me, that's pretty convincing uh, proof. Is anybody not convinced? All right, but what he brings up is actually a pretty good point. Putting strings in there is not the way you usually want to do this. The reason why is because the chances of, if I'm using some library, of someone else using the string key for lock is pretty high. And I don't want my locks to be interfered with by the locks of other random threads. I want to use something that's like exclusively for my application's use because I only want to not enter here if somebody is in here. And so the way we do this is in the locks fixed solution. In locks fixed, we create this object thing called my lock object. Now, an object is like the simplest possible variable you can have. It has basically no functionality. You can compare it to other objects. That's basically it. You can figure out if it's the same object as something else. Um, it's essentially just a memory location, but there's nothing at that memory location except for that object. Almost a useless uh, idea except it is unique. My lock object is different from all the other objects in the world. And so when I say lock, I will pass in my lock object. So I could have a my audio lock object, I could have a my video lock object, all these different kinds of things. And my locks will then be only locking with the other ones that I match with those keys. So in that way, my key is completely unique to the locks that I want it to be unique to. So I have my lock object up here, and I have my lock object down there. And in that, with, the, with just those few lines of code added in, I'm now immune to threads crashing in that particular way. Any questions? All right. So, let's go ahead and tackle images. We're going to learn how to get image streams in native code today. So that's a fancy way of saying we're going to do video recording. Just like with audio, the APIs get more and more complex the more data that you have to handle. And in this case, we are handling a lot of data. With 1080p video recording in the pixel format that the phone records in, it's like 200 megabytes a second, over 200 megabytes a second. We can run out of memory on our phone in like two seconds. It's pretty easy. Um, in fact, the phone won't even let us record in 1080p if we ask for a raw video stream. It just doesn't even want to give us that much data at once. So although the um, APIs in order to do this kind of recording are uh, complex, they're not quite as complex as Wasabi, which is nice. Um, we're going to mostly be limiting ourselves to 720p video streams, partly because it's just too much data for our poor uh, camera, for a poor processor to handle, and also partly because we just can't record in raw uh, a raw data stream. And you'll understand what I mean by a raw data stream versus a compressed data stream in a minute. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be dealing with 720p uh, for the rest of this lecture 
which is more than enough for pretty much anything that we'll ever need to do as far as live signal processing goes. There is a way to get a 1080p stream if you want it, but we'll talk about that later. So, uh, rather than go through all the implementation details, we're going to take a high-level view, and then we're just going to use a wrapper class. So, rather than having to write libvideo by ourselves, we're just going to use a pre-made libvideo. That's what I call it, libvideo, whatever. Um, if you want to learn how the internals of this kind of thing work, because libvideo doesn't do everything, um, you can check out these MSDN docs, and there's also a Nokia wiki that was how I learned how to do most of this stuff, which is really helpful. And they have code samples and such of how to do things like record video and audio at the same time, for instance. Um, you can't use Wasapi to record from the microphone if you're also getting uh, video from this audio video capture device thing. That's a, um, that's a limitation. So you have to either get only video from the audio video capture device thing and then get audio from Wasapi, in which case there is no timing information between the two. So if the camera has one lag and the audio stream has another lag, you don't really know what those two lags are unless you kind of experimentally go through and figure out what that is by yourself. If you get both the audio and the video from the audio video capture device, however, you get a frame of video and the corresponding chunk of audio that was during that frame at the same time. And so that's how people do things like Skype messaging, is they get those streams of data at the same time kind of packetized uh, together. And after going through this kind of high-level view of what these things look like, we're going to take a look at how to, uh, how to manipulate them, which is pretty fun. So let's go ahead and take a look. So this is the structure of the application that we're going to be dealing with. We have our XAML that communicates with our C-sharp code, of course. And we're going to have this thing called text, well, we, I call it here a texture renderer, but the actual C++ name is texture graph. It works an awful lot like the line graph that we've been dealing with, with before. Only instead of giving it a bunch of points to draw as a one-dimensional line, sorry, a two-dimensional line, we're going to give it essentially a matrix of values and it will interpret them as color and print them out to the screen like a texture. We're also going to have a C++ object called libvideo. Actually, I think it's called libvideo.camera. And this guy communicates with the camera hardware and exposes events for your C-sharp code to start doing things with the, uh, the frames of data that are coming out of it. This C sharp code can then do things like send that send those frames of data to another C++ processing uh, class, or you can have libvideo uh, send it directly to C++. The difference between those two is surprisingly small. We'll take a look in a minute. And then from your C++ processing class, you can send those off to the texture renderer, or you can send them through C sharp as well, I guess. I didn't draw arrows for that. I got tired of drawing arrows after a while. So images are represented as arrays of 32-bit pixels. <clears throat> so each pixel is a little dot on the screen. And the way that we encode the color for that dot is, in this case, what's called ARGB. And ARGB splits up the 32-bit uh, number into four chunks, eight bits each, which are the alpha, red, green, and blue channels. Alpha, in this case, meaning transparency. So those of you who have ever done anything with Photoshop or any kind of image processing, this is pretty familiar to you. We address them as unsigned integer arrays, of course, <clears throat> and you'll find a lot of C-sharp APIs passing around int array values as pixel data. Whoopsies. Uh, these are logically laid out as a two-dimensional array. So even though it looks like a one-dimensional array, it's actually a two-dimensional array. So in order to address whichever pixel we want to look at, we have to do the math to skip around by saying, you know, data of y times width plus x. That kind of a thing. Has anyone not seen this kind of math before? Cool. I mean, it's just, I know it's just addition and, and multiplication and such, but this is how you take your x and y coordinates and uh, get to the proper uh, bytes in a flat array. 
And if you were to want to, say, manually assign pixel values, you can use hexadecimal to build a 32-bit uh, number, and you can assign the colors in hexadecimal. So here, uh, FF, of course, means 255 all by itself. So I have one byte that's 255, one byte that's 255, one byte that's 255, like this. And so these numbers would correspond to the, um, to the numbers for each color channel in that single pixel. This is only really useful if you wanted to do something like have a for loop to set your entire, uh, your entire image to red or something like that. We will be doing things like, uh, like for fun, we could do things like tint everything red, where we would go through each pixel, we would split out this little byte of data, and we would make it larger or something like that. And that's how you would t uh, make everything redder. <clears throat> so lib video will open up a camera at a specific capture and preview resolution. There are two, uh, two kind of ways that you can get data from the camera. The first is what's called a preview buffer. That's what you get when, say, you open up your camera application and it's showing you the room through the viewfinder. And then when you start hitting record, then it switches over to capture mode. Now, as I said before, uh, we're only going to be doing we're only going to be dealing with 720p. But the difference between preview and capture is that preview only will give us a lower resolution video stream. So for instance, if we wanted to capture at 1080p, it would allow us to preview at 720p. Or if we wanted to capture at 720p, we could preview at 720p or 480p, that kind of thing. For those of you who don't know, this 720p business means that we have 720 vertical lines uh, in, our, in, our, in our image. So, um, because we are not going, uh, so the difference between preview and capture is that preview will give us the raw data. So it's laid out like this in memory. Capture, we're only really going to capture when we want to get, say, 1080p stream. And for that, it won't give us the raw data. So we get a compressed data stream instead. Compression is a way for the, um, for the computer to throw out pieces of information that it thinks it doesn't need by, say, finding patterns. So instead of writing 250 zeros, it will write zero and then the number 250. <laughs> um, those kinds of algorithms in order to compress the data stream. And so you don't get raw pixel values and you can't really manipulate that kind of a stream easily. You would have to what's called decompress it, then manipulate it, then uh, recompress it. We're not going to do that because that gets really complicated. So we're just going to deal with the raw data stream, which is the preview data stream running at 720p for this whole homework and uh, pretty much the whole class. There is one case where you would really want to use a compressed data stream, and it's really nice, which is if you were to either store this data or want to transmit it over the network. Because I guarantee you, you are not going to be able to transmit 230 megabits per second over your Wi-Fi. When you compress these frames, it compresses them down to uh, maybe two megabytes per second, or probably less. So then we can transmit over Wi-Fi, no problem. Uh, the problem with that is that, of course, we cannot manipulate the stream easily at that point. So the way that LibVideo works is it sets up an internal processing thread to manage a buffer of frames. So every time the camera gives it a buffer of frames, it will add that buffer to its little list of buffers that have been captured. It exposes what's called an on-frame ready event that gets fired every time a frame is received. And so when that frame gets received, it triggers that event and allows you to process or output or whatever your uh, particular um, your particular frame. If your code is too slow, so if you spend too much time processing and more frames are coming in than it has space to deal with, it's going to just drop frames. So kind of like lib sound, if you spend too much time in your audio in callback, then you're going to have discontinuities in your data. That's a little less visible in video as it is in audio. Well, visible is a bad word for talking about audio. But uh, if you have discontinuities of even just a couple samples, our ears hear them very, very easily. It sounds like crackling. 
With video, it's not nearly as perceptible. You can do the most incredible things to video and our eyes don't care. It's actually quite amazing. It's one of the reasons why image processing tends to be a lot more lax than uh, sound processing because your, our ears are incredibly sensitive whereas our eyes don't care quite so much about the exact pixel values. Um, so that's good for us because it means that we don't have to be quite so careful. As I said before, uh, it can do audio input as well, but uh, that slide's actually wrong. I took out the on audio ready because it made the code a little simpler. So don't worry about that. If you guys really, really need audio input and output, that would be a great thing for you guys to, uh, to delve into and do for your final projects. So you can take a look at the code that I used to have in there. I'll give it to you guys if you really want. Um, so a note about these events. The way that we've done the audio input and output before is that it passes in buffers from the microphone and takes out buffers for the audio out event and such. For this, that's not really going to work because, as we stated a long time ago, when we deal with platform arrays, they make copies of the data underneath when we pass them back and forth. And previously I said, oh, it's only 480 floats, or 480 floating point numbers. That's not such a big deal. Well, now it's starting to get a little bit more of a big deal. For a 720p frame, we're talking like, uh, what would that be? Uh, more than a megabyte of, of data that we're doing 30 times a second. And that kind of a copy is going to start taking an appreciable amount of time. And so it's just way too slow for the kind of stuff we want to do. So what we're going to do is rather than pass uh, arrays around, we're going to pass a pointer through C-sharp code. Now immediately you say, wait a minute, we just spent like the entire class saying that we couldn't do this. And the answer is, uh, we have something that's going to make computer science groan and shake their heads to solve this problem. The way that we're going to do it is we're going to treat a pointer exactly like how it is. We're going to treat it like a number. So in this case, we have this data type called uint pointer underscore t. This is like a, this is a very C style naming convention. The underscore t at the end means that it's a type. uint means unsigned integer and ptr means pointer. And this, in our architecture, is just an unsigned int. So we're going to take our unsigned int star and store it as just an unsigned int. And when we do that, what happens is, instead of treating it like a pointer, it just treats it like a number, which is a memory address. And we can pass an unsigned integer through C-sharp code just fine. And we can then take that number and pass it to other C++ codes, and it can reinterpret it as a pointer and get the data that it needs. Now, I realize that this is kind of a weird, um, a weird thing to talk about. So let me go ahead and just draw it a minute so we can all see what's going on. We have a C++, uh, a C++ object that's getting data from the camera. And the data that it gets, we're going to call P. And P is, say, an unsigned integer Pointer, that's what that little star thing means. And so it points to a memory location that's some array, right? This memory location is a number. Let's say it's 0x, 1, f, a, d, e, uh, 0. All right? Now we can not pass this pointer into C, plus, into C sharp land and treat it like a pointer in an array and access all the individual elements. What we can send is this number. And so if we send this number into C sharp land, we can then send that number into a different C++, plus plus, uh, into a different C++ plus plus element and treat the number as a memory address and get pointing back to the same array. Of course, that means that this guy can't destroy P until this guy is done with it, but that's okay. Any questions about this? So um, everything inside the program is in a single process, I mean, in a single namespace, where address, address space. 
Right, as long as we're inside of a process, we can, add, we can address this memory. We couldn't send it out to another process. But since we're all in a, uh, we're all in the same, um, yes, I the mean, same, yeah. I mean, the C++ part and the C sharp part is, is in a single process, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes? What does that say under the memory? It's, I mean, it's just a memory address in hexadecimal. Okay. I could, there are things you can spell in hexadecimal, though. But anyway. Uh, um, so, what number do you exactly get on the array? What number? Yeah, like, but, uh, I kind of lost you like, the second half of it. So, this number is the address of this array. So, if you remember um, anything about pointers, the location of a, you know what? Maybe we should just do a live demo of this as well. <laughs> because I did this for a couple uh, students at office hours, but it might be helpful to do this for everybody so that we all are completely caught up on how pointers work. So I'm going to create a very simple C program. And this C program is going to use pointers. Those of you who have used C before may recognize some of this stuff. But those of you who haven't, don't worry because it's pretty simple. So I'm going to save this as test.cpp and I will compile it. And run it. All right, so here's what's going on. I have a simple function called main. Main is the function that gets called when our program starts. So it's kind of like the main page constructor in our C sharp program. This function is creating an integer called a. It's calling this function called printf, and it says printf hello world. And then has this percentage sign d thing. Can you guys read that, or is it too small? Do I need to make it bigger? All right. I heard a couple. It's too smalls. So let's see if we can't bump it up a few. That's a little bit better. All right. So we have this thing called a that's equal to 1. We pass it in as an argument, so it just prints out 1 there. And this return 0 is just because you have to return something from your main method. So don't worry about that. All right. Let's delve into the world of pointers. I can make a floating point array. I can call it f. And I can say there's 10 elements inside of it. Or if we want to use the notation that we've been using all class, we can say new float at 10, like that. I can then say things like f0 equals 1, f1 equals 2, etc. Then down here, instead of printing hello world, I'll print out f is equal to, and I'll print out two floating point numbers, f0 and f1. All right. I run this. I need to put a new line at the end so that it is nice and pretty. And it says this. f is equal to 1.00, 2.00. Any questions about that? All right. Now, I am kind of blithely using this star thing and this new operator without completely talking about what these things mean. This star operator means it's a pointer, means it points to a location in memory. Now we can look at that location in memory. If I, instead of saying f0, if I instead just say f, what happens when I compile it is that it'll actually print out a warning. It'll say, you're telling me that you're going to print a double, but the argument has type float star. And I say, okay, that doesn't really help me much. But if I tell it I'm going to print out an integer, this, this percentage d thing, you, you remember that's what I used to print out the integer a. If I tell it I'm going to print out an integer, I ignore the warning. Oh, I should put a new line. I ignore the warning, and I just run it anyway. What happens is it says f is equal to this really big number. And notice I'm not printing out f sub 0. I'm just printing out f. So what this is printing out is this number represents the location of f in memory. Because 0 is the very, very first byte, and however much memory I have bytes later, it ends. So, so integer is the address of the f? 
the address of this guy is an integer. Yeah. So, that, so whatever that, the, the one you have at is an integer. Yeah. So if I say unsigned int address equals f, and then I print out address, it says cannot initialize a variable of type unsigned int with an L value of type float star. What that means is it doesn't want to let me do this, but I can force it by typecasting, right? Because it's, it wants to think of f as a, as a location of floats, and it says this doesn't make any sense. And I'm telling it, gosh darn, yes it does, so then it just listens to me. No, it doesn't. I have to say this. Will that work? Nope. Why aren't you working? Oh, loses information. Oh, okay. <sighs> yes. That's going to be a whole nother... Yes, thank you. So this is because... There we go. So let me go ahead and make this unsigned long. There we go. All right, so the reason I had to change it from unsigned int to unsigned long is because on the architecture of my computer, it's a 64-bit uh, processor, which means that a pointer is actually an unsigned long, not an unsigned int. It's actually eight bytes large, not four bytes large. And then I should be able to get rid of all this fancy notation where I had this ampersand and this zero thing. I should be able to do this anyway, as well. Yeah, okay, cool. So, I can just force f to be an unsigned long, store into this thing address, and then I can treat it like a, like a normal number. I can even do uh, arithmetic on this. I can say address equals, I can say address plus equals four, right? And when I run this again, it will do the addition for us. You say, oh my gosh, what does this mean? Well, if I were to then have a floating point array called G and say I'm going to force address to be a floating point array like this, and then I print out the zeroth element of G. So we're going to say treat it like a floating point number, and we'll say G is equal to, and let's Let's assign a few more values here. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 3, 4, 5, 6. You know what? Maybe I should just give them the values that are the actual indices. Maybe that will help decrease my own confusion a little bit. So if I were to run this, it says g is equal to 1.0. That's because I get the address of f, which is the address of the very first byte or the very first float here. I increment it by four, which is the size of a floating point number. So then when I say, okay, give me a I'm going to treat this new address as a pointer to floating point numbers, and I say, get me the first one at your location by g sub zero, it gets me this guy. Because a floating point number is four bytes large. So when I increment my memory address by four, remember, I'm just talking about all the different bytes in memory. So when I move forward four bytes, I get to the next element in the array. Why you Yeah, that's a good question. So if I do like two, it says it's equal to zero. And that's because the zeroth element is all zeros, and the first element is zeros up until the very end, because one is not a very large number. If, if I made this a really, really, really large number, we would probably get something different. Yeah, we get 366, because it's just, it's looking at, ran, it's looking at half of a floating point number here, half of a floating point number here, and doing its best to turn it into a floating point number. And it does, because those bits mean something. And what those bits mean is 366, apparently. 
So you can, you can always interpret data however you want to interpret them. But it doesn't always make sense. If I, if I put this back up to 4, then we get that number, which is pretty darn close to this number. The reason why it's not exactly the same is a whole other class, but we don't worry about that. If we put it back to 100, then it's just 100. Any questions? So this is exactly the kind of thing that we're going to be doing in this homework. Because... All we're doing is we're taking this array, treating it like a number, and then we can pass it around through C-sharp. Then when we get it again in the other C++, uh, the other C++ component, we're going to retreat it like an, like an array or like a pointer. And because the number hasn't changed, we're good. We don't have to worry about uh, it being the wrong location in memory. So you want to pass the address from C++ to C sharp? Yep. And then from C sharp to a different C++ component. You couldn't just directly pass it from one C++ to another C++ thing? Um, you could, but let me ask you, do you know how to do that? <laughs> do you know how to do that? I do know how to do that. Well, why don't you teach us that? Instead. We could. But so, so there's there's two ways we could do this, right? We could build everything in one giant C component. And then we could just do all of our processing and our capturing and everything in there. The reason we don't want to do that is because we want to be able to reuse the pieces of our projects in future projects. And if you have to go through and rip out all the custom processing that you were doing in homework five, it's not going to be very, it's not going to be very efficient. Compo making things modular is a really big concern for people like us because we work on projects for a couple months and then we leave them and we don't come back to them for a while. So when we want to, when you, you know, two years down the line are like, okay, I really want to make that sweet Windows app that I've been thinking about, you know, for two years. You're going to come back to your code from, that you wrote during this class, and you're going to want it to be as modular as possible, because otherwise you're going to look at your code and you're going to be like, do I have to do this in this class, or is this part of a different class that really should have been split out into its own thing, because I'm doing two things that are only marginally related, all in the same project. That's the first reason why we don't want to do everything in one big C++ class. Now you say, okay, I'll split it out into two C++ projects. There are two ways to share information between C++ projects. The first way is we can make C++ CX components, which are components that are, you know, consumable by C Sharp. If we do it that way, then the way that we link these projects together is through references. And that way is really easy, and that's the way I want you to do it. And when you do it that way, you can't pass pointers around just straight up. If you want to create a pure C++ class, that is a fair bit more of work. And it involve, the reason it's a fair bit more work is because it involves mucking around. Let's see if I have any C++ components here. Nope. So if I add a new C++ component, la -di -da, -di da runtime component, we'll call it blah. So when I add the C++ component blah, if I want it to link to another C++ component, like directly C++ to C++, I have to go into properties, I have to go into the linker tell, and tell it, okay, I want you to import these .lib files, I have to go into uh, the paths for, where is it, uh, preprocessor, nope. General, additional include directories. I have to go in here and edit these guys. If you all remember going in here and editing stuff in here like this to include Wasapi, it's like 10 times worse in order to link together two C++ projects. So I thought to myself, rather than have to answer 30 students asking, why does it work when I build it on the, deep, uh, on the emulator but not work when I build it on the phone, I thought, let's do it the easy way and do it where we just pass a number through C Sharp. So, if you really want to build your own C++ component, I will teach you how and how to link them all together. 
but I guarantee it won't be as easy as we do it as if we do it through C sharp. It will be just as performant, and you get to learn about pointers. All right. Yes. Exactly. We won't be able to manipulate the data stream in C sharp at all, but we will be able to pass it in between C++ components. And when I say use C sharp to pass it around, you'll realize pretty quick that this is a, like, C sharp is doing nothing, and we'll see that in a minute. So does everybody understand this idea of using addresses, sending them around, and reinterpreting the addresses as arrays? Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier saying the, the data when you change and tell the second C++ to finish with it. Yeah. So let's say I, you have the address, address is stop. In your first C++, you pass it out to C sharp, C sharp got it, pass it to a second, but before all that, all that always happened, you want the data changes in the C++. We're going to make sure that it doesn't change. And luckily, LibVideo is going to do all that for you. I'll explain how it works. But it's pretty simple. Basically, we call a function inside this guy. And while that function is running, we do all this and then come back. So this guy won't capture anything. This guy won't try to send anything further until that processing is done. There is another thread inside this guy between the actual capturing. And so if he captures frames and this guy is not responding because he's spending so much time processing, that's why I said where he'll just drop frames. He just won't write anything to that buffer until you signal that you're done with your processing and it can write into the buffer now. Yes? So, the flow that you're pointing to F and you're setting the flow to be a size of 10? Yes. But you don't have 10 elements, there's so just you know, 7 elements in there? So, when I run this, there are already by the time I finish this line, there are already 10 elements sitting inside f. I don't know what their values are, except that new gives me a memory location. And so it, it gives me a memory location, and there's just stuff already in there. Usually, for most operating systems, new, new will, uh, will initialize everything to 0. So f0 through 9 are all zero. So what I'm doing here is I'm giving them new values. And so the next line, the unsigned long? Yep. Is long, is long, is long is a data type like int and uh, float. In this case, unsigned long means an eight byte value that counts from zero up to like 64 it's not quadrillion, but it's some really large number. An address, you're, you're creating an address, or how, how do you explain that again? So I'm creating a variable here that holds the value, which is the memory address of f. Because f itself is an address. That's what this little star thing means. It's a pointer. And so the memory location that it points to is represented by a number. And that number is getting stored inside the variable address. So unsigned long next to f in parentheses is going to give you the amount or the size of the memory allocation instead of f? Uh, it will give me the location of the memory allocation. Yes. So it's that is a typecast because the the compiler wants you to make wants to make sure that you know what you're doing because Programmers usually don't try, they usually try not to mix types. We can talk about it more after class. So, what we're going to have is we're going to have an event in our lib video that will give us the memory location of the buffer of video that we're, or so the, the image that we're going to manipulate. And the type is going to be unsigned int. So this brings us, that is kind of our sensing side. Let's look at our display side. We have this thing called texture graph. 
and it's a class that's similar in spirit to line graph. Uh, it's going to take an image and render it as what's called a textured quad. So for those of you who have done any kind of graphics programming or wanted to be video game programmers, uh, you'll know what that means. But for the rest of you, it doesn't really matter. We have we're going to be doing at, I mean, it's going to be fast enough to do at least 30 frames per second playback. Um, and it's going to give us the ability to do kind of live image processing. It uses the same pixel format as the camera, so we don't have to do any translation from getting the data in to sending it out. And so instead of calling set array, we now have this thing called set texture, or in our case, set texture pointer. So, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't update this slide from last year, so let me read through this and make sure this is actually what we're doing. Um, yeah, this is what you're going to be doing in the, in the, I guess I did update this, cool. So, we are going to have this livevideo.camera as texture graph dot texture graph interop. And we could connect the camera's on frame ready event straight to set texture. And that is what the sample code does. So let me just pull up the sample code real quick and show you what I mean. If I open up the video, so we already looked at the app lifecycle sample code. We already looked at the locks sample code. So the video sample code looks like this. We have, uh, that's an awful lot of C++ plus code that was already written for you. And so all we have is, in the XAML, we're going to have a single drawing uh, surface, which is the same thing that you added for a line graph. And in this case, I have it just taking up the entire window. And then in the C-sharp, we have the video canvas loaded event. And inside, it's going to do stuff that's really similar to what we did for the line graph. And then at the end, we create this thing called cam equals new camera. Let me just blow this up a little bit. We tell it the size that we want it to capture at. In this case, we're saying uh, 1280 by 720. So that's 720p resolution. We tell it when to use the back camera. And then we say, when you have a frame ready, send it to the texture graphs set texture pointer function. And so what that does is something like this. Let me see if I have it installed on this phone. I do. So what that does is it just gives you a live view out of the camera. So I don't know if you guys can see anything because it's kind of dark over here, but you have maybe a frame or two of, uh, of latency, and it works really, really well. And the reason it works really, really well is because we're doing all the hard work in C++. Because the camera class is written in C++, and the texture graph class is written in C++. And when I say we pass something through C Sharp, that's kind of disingenuous, because all we're doing is we're saying the on-frame ready event, I'm subscribing set texture pointer to that. So set texture pointer is just a normal C++ function. I can say text graph dot set texture pointer. And all it is is it says, okay, it returns nothing void, and it takes in a uint width, a uint height, and a uint data pointer. And what do you know? Cam dot on frame ready is a function is a event. And if I look at the delegate for that event, if you remember back a couple lectures, we were talking about delegates and events and how to use them. So we go into lib video, we go into camera. Let's blow it up a little bit. We look at the frame ready event. The frame ready event gives out a uint width, a uint height, and a uint data pointer. So this event calls a function with those arguments, and we're literally just saying, call this function with those arguments. And so that is how you hook up two C++, event, two C++ objects with C Sharp. And we don't even have a function in C Sharp that's getting called every time a frame is ready. It's, the C++ is just calling the other C++ directly. And the reason we can hook them up this easily 
is because they're C++ CX classes. So C Sharp can see them, and they can see each other. They just can't pass around pointers directly. So that's why we have to do the dirty pointer trick. Any questions about this? So displaying a video in every transaction is okay. Yes. Yeah, it has to be. There is a way to display video in C Sharp, but um, it's very computer science-y and not really targeted towards real-time image processing. So if you wanted to modify the data stream, it would be a pain in the neck. So this is the easiest way for us. Yes? It seems pretty easy to have C Sharp be the mediator. So why do those computer scientists hate us for that? They hate us for it because um, what we're doing here is it's got a lot of hidden assumptions behind it. The first hidden assumption is that one C component can access the memory of another C component. That's a fine assumption to make and will always be true for this case. But if we were on a different architecture, that might not be the case. Another hidden assumption that we're making is that the size of a pointer is an unsigned integer. That is not the case on, for instance, my laptop. My laptop is an unsigned log. Uh, there are good ways to take care of this kind of thing. They're just more complicated. Um, most computer scientists would say, uh, if you want to do this kind of a thing, you should have your C++ things talk directly instead of having C Sharp be the mediator. I mean, I guess it's fine. But and not, not many people would have a problem with this application in particular. But doing this kind of thing willy-nilly is a recipe for having your code work on the phone, but not on the desktop, for instance. Right, so if that we, works because we're in this specific... Right, it works because we're in this specific situation, exactly. It would, this code would not port well to the desktop. If we wanted to port it to the desktop, it would be best to have the C++ objects talk to each other directly, because the size of pointers would change. That's the biggest problem. It's not that big of a problem, but it's a problem. All right, so this is actually one of my favorite parts of teaching this class, is this image processing homework. Because unlike uh, audio, where we have to be careful, so we do this complicated convolution thing, and we have to design filters delicately and things like that. With image processing, you can get really instant feedback for really cool effects very quickly. And so, um, some of you can probably feel the wind shifting, and you're kind of seeing what this homework is going to be about. It is going to be about real-time image processing. So we can start just playing around with the raw RGBA values of the image as it's passing through. And you'll notice I don't have a live demo of doing that, but uh, there will be a code sample that's put up later, probably by tomorrow. We can do things like we can threshold the image to make things stand out. That's, so for those of you who haven't taken an image processing class, there are some really simple operations that people tend to do. And this is kind of my slide explaining that uh, nomenclature. Things like thresholding means you set everything to zero unless there, it's above a certain value. So you can find red objects in the room by analyzing the red channel of a um, the red channel of an image, and then if that pixel's red value is above a certain value, you leave it alone. Otherwise, you set it to zero. So that will set everything to black except for things that have a significant red component. You can do things like um, look at the the values of neighboring pixels and such. So you can start to look at kind of regions of a of an image. So you can say, I want to set everything to zero except those that are red and have red for the surrounding you know, radius of eight pixels, that kind of a thing. Then you get, start to get into the area of what's called segmentation, where you try and take an image and say, this region is object A, this region is object B. You can even take Fourier transforms. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are just dying to take Fourier transforms of images. But it's actually kind of cool, because you can take what's called a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and you can actually filter it. You can do two-dimensional convolution. And you can do things like you can have, uh, you can make a picture more blurry by re removing the high frequencies. Because high frequencies mean sharp transitions. So uh, edges between, say, the background and my arm 
that's a high frequency because the color changes rapidly as you move along the pixels. There was actually a neat research project recently where a student took pictures that were blurry and made a inverse filter where it boosted the high frequencies. And he took blurry pictures and made them sharper. And it actually worked pretty well. It was, it was really grainy, but it, he was able to kind of get detail that you would look at the picture and say, there's no detail there. But he would get detail, and it was the actual detail. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> such a downer. So I say all this fun comes at a price, which is basically my way of saying we are processing a lot of data. So if you were to try and do something like, um, for instance, in the last homework, we were doing a convolution where we had an impulse response that was anywhere from 70 to 200 points long. And we were convolving it with input buffers that were 480 points long. And I think I said before something about computational complexity with big O notation where I said n times m blah, 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 blah. Basically, it meant you know, we were doing so many thousands of operations per second. In this case, um, at the low resolution of 800 by 480, we're talking like 800 times more data for each buffer. And this buffer is only coming 30 times a second instead of 100 times a second that we have for audio. But it's still a lot more data. And then if you were to try and do something like convolution on this guy with a two-dimensional kernel instead of a one-dimensional impulse response, where that two-dimensional impulse response is you know, 10 by 10 uh, elements, you can see very, very quickly we get to a lot of operations per second. And so in the homework that I'm going to hand out, I think pretty much everybody in the class was fiddling around with algorithms to, uh, to you know, try and make the, the stuff work. And everybody ran into places where the phone just couldn't keep up with what they were trying, trying to do. The homework is kind of creative in an algorithm sense. I don't give you an algorithm to solve the problem. I say, here's the problem. Now find an algorithm to solve it. And people would try one algorithm, and it might work, but it would take like a second per frame. And that's no good. So then they would try a different one, and that would take you know a tenth of a second per frame, which is better, but still not perfect, and, such, and so on and so forth. And so they would come up with tricks to make it faster, blah, 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 blah. So with audio, we tend not to run into that problem too much because computers are pretty fast. With video, we will run into that problem. One thing I will say is that at the top of Visual Studio, we have this thing that says debug and release. Some of you have accidentally turned on release by default and wondered why your debugging no longer works properly. That's because when you set it to release mode, that enables a bunch of compiler settings that say, go ahead and get rid of unnecessary stuff as much as possible to make the code faster, leaner, and meaner. So things like, if I turn on release mode, this capture size variable will no longer exist because the compiler knows that I'm only using capture size right here, so it will just construct a temporary object and then send it straight into camera. And so if I run the debugger and pause it here and try and look at the value of capture size, it'll say capture size doesn't even exist. In release mode, it'll even do things like rearrange your lines of code in a way that doesn't affect the output, but allows it to run faster. A lot of really awesome black magic voodoo goes on when you put on release mode. And so when you're debugging it, a lot of stuff just won't make sense. You will hit next, like the next line thing, and it will go like this through your file. It's bizarre. Um, so don't try and debug release, release mode code, but if you are worried that your algorithm is not fast enough, do run it in release mode. Because in release mode, it will actually run faster. I think I had an algorithm that ran like 20% faster in, in release mode versus debug mode for this homework. And so it does make a, a pretty big difference. So if, you're, if you feel like you're right on the edge and you don't want to spend any more time trying to speed up your code, then run it in release mode and see if it works. If it's not working how you want it to work, definitely run it in debug mode to figure out what's going on. Um, <clears throat> there is an interesting thing called cache locality on the phone. Cache locality means basically um, the order in which you 
access elements matters if you're running like a for loop over your array. If we go back to the pixel accessing math here, we see that if I have an image that looks like this, it's laid out as a flat array, and I instead treat it like it's a two-dimensional array, where this is the zeroth element, this is the first element, this is the second element, I go like this, and then I wrap around and go like this, right? So, if I were to access this element, then this element, then this element, in reality, that means I'm accessing this element, then this element, then this element. Now, processors are very smart. They're very smart, and they're also kind of stupid. They will, when I access this element, preload in this one as well. Which means that it's actually faster for me to go one, two, three than it is to go one, two, three. Because when I go one, two, three, these elements will already have been loaded in by the, by the processor. And if I go one, two, three, it has to do the full work every time instead of getting half the work done ahead of time when I grab that one. This is done because processors are built by humans, and humans know that when we loop through an array, we're probably going to access the next one after we access the current one. What that means is, sometimes when you complain about your, your algorithms being too slow, I will say, are you going over the x direction first, or are you going over the y direction first? Because it sounds incredible, but it actually does matter. Now, this isn't meant to say that you go over all your algorithms and you only do things in the x direction. There are times when you have to do things in the y direction, right? But the idea is, in your innermost loops, you always want to go over the x directions first. So, if you have a giant image, and for some reason you want to look at a smaller, uh, a smaller part of the image, like say you want to figure out if the pixel at the center is surrounded by all red pixels, that means that you would want to check the neighboring pixels like this, instead of like this. That's all I'm talking about. And for some other al algorithms, there's just no way around it. It's just too much data, and there's no way that you can run the algorithm that you want to on the image. And for that, we have two options. The first is to make your problem smaller by throwing out some of the data. And the other option is to increase your computation power by turning to the cloud or something like that, using the GPU on your device, et cetera. We are not going to cover using the GPU on the device, and we're not going to cover using the cloud or anything like that, except for maybe a bonus lecture in a couple weeks. Um, but certainly not in time for you guys to base your entire final project off of it. All of your final projects, unless you guys are really hardcore, like you know so much about networking that you think it's going to be no problem at all, then you guys can do some cloud computation stuff if you want, or desktop computation as it's likely going to be, because I don't think any of us have uh, servers on the cloud just itching to run our signal processing code for a class. But uh, yeah, for downsampling your image, there will be a nice, simple solution. And the nice, simple solution is basically you skip pixels. And we're just not going to worry about the aliasing problems that we talked about with audio because it's just not going to be as noticeable for our eyes or our algorithms in this case. Uh, are there any questions about this image processing stuff? Because we're actually going to take a break from image processing and talk about some other stuff. Okay, if not, then let's go ahead and take like a, well, there's no clock up there. Let's go ahead and take like a 10, 15 minute break and we'll come back to it. Yes. Screen on my phone stopped working. That's terrible.
necessarily. I mean, of course, it happened last night. Yeah, um, I'm sure it did. So I have phase one all working and tested, and phase two and three. Best effort. Okay, so, all right. Uh, did you try doing the reset thing where you hold down this and this at the same time? No, because I didn't know about that. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'll test it and figure out if it's not working. I have another phone for you, so awesome. just make sure to get it for me during the discussion time today. Okay. Are you by chance still uh, recording, or did that not work? <laughs> I am recording, actually. I'm recording right now. I guess I'll just record for you. I didn't know if you set it up for tonight. I know you were going to try it last week, and I'm not sure if it was going to work. I'm just um, thinking about because uh, I'm going to be going. Anyway, so. I, did, I did upload it you from did. last week. Okay. Yeah. So there's a post on the discussion board right. about that. I didn't, I didn't see it on there. I just figured I'd ask. Yep. Um, I'm going to stop recording.